It's 3.16 p.m. on April 10th, 2018. A 911 operator receives a call from 16-year-old Kyle Plush, who had just experienced a freak accident. In the minutes prior to this call, Kyle had just arrived at the Seven Hill School in Cincinnati, Ohio for a tennis match. He had been driving a 2004 Honda Odyssey, a minivan that featured three rows of seating, with his gear for the day's match being stored in the very back. In order to retrieve it, Kyle climbed to the back of the vehicle and reached over the third row seating, extending his body as far as it could go in order to grab his equipment, when suddenly, the seat's folding mechanism was engaged, causing it to collapse into its storage position, taking Kyle with it. In an instant, he was pinned and completely unable to move as he was now trapped in the car upside down, not even being able to move his arms and hands enough to grab his cell phone. Though luckily, his phone had Siri, which he would call out to to call the police. While on the phone, Kyle couldn't hear anything given how far away he was from the device, but he stated as clearly as he could that he was in dire need of help. Due to the position he was stuck in, he was already struggling to breathe, and he knew he was likely not going to survive much longer, which he made very clear to the operator. I'm, I'm in desperate need of help. Hello? Less than one minute later, the call would cut out. In the recording, Kyle clearly portrayed to the operator where he was, that he couldn't hear her, and that his life was in danger, which prompted her to immediately send a patrol car over to the school in search of him. Though inexplicably, she never told the officers that Kyle believed he was going to die. Not understanding how dire the situation was, the officers that pulled up to the scene didn't even bother to stop the car. Instead, they simply drove throughout the parking lot, unsure of what car was Kyle's. They didn't even bother to turn down their music or crack a window. seemingly being more interested in the types of cars that other students were driving. As officers continued their half-hearted search, another phone call would be made to 911. It was Kyle, whose tone was now drastically different. I probably don't have much time left. To tell my mom that I love her if I die. This is not a joke. After Kyle says his goodbyes, he tries one more time to relay what was happening, this time providing the parking lot he was in, along with the exact make and model of his car. This is not a joke. I'm trapped inside my gold Honda Odyssey van in the software parking lot. Knowing, w knowing what, like, what, you know, when I was a young guy, I ain't gonna lie, I don't think I would have known what vehicle I was in. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like Ford, you know what I'm saying? But, like, the make, the, the model as well? Nah, bro. Nah, I ain't gonna lie. It, well, how old did they say, bro, she was? Like 10? I want to say like 10-ish. Like 10 or 13, you know what I'm saying? I don't... I might have known, ain't gonna lie. I might have. But still, that's... that's. Yo, that's a, that's, that's a scary situation, bro. Too. And, 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 and telling you, like, like basically, like, giving your last words, you're talking about telling my mom I love her. That, that's sad, bro. Like, what the fuck? It's seven hills, hills back. Send officers immediately. I'm almost dead. At this point, officers were still in the parking lot looking for him. Help was literally just a few feet away. And on top of this, the operator was also able to get a ping from Kyle's phone, which gave coordinates to his exact location within just five to 10 feet of his vehicle. Oh, and yet, the dispatcher never passed this information along. As Kyle remained on the line fighting for his life, the officers on the scene would pull out of the parking lot, close their report, 
and carry on with their day, stating, I don't see nobody, which I didn't imagine I would. With this line making it apparent that those involved with the case never actually believed this situation was real, and instead viewed it all as a hoax. Right. Just minutes later, Kyle would go quiet, and the phone would disconnect for a final time. It would take six hours for that trunk to be opened, and not by the police, but instead by Kyle's father, who had no idea that any of this had taken place, seeking out his son's vehicle only to find Kyle flipped upside down in the trunk. He had been dead for hours. Despite the circumstances, Kyle did everything right. He remained calm, he was respectful, and he described exactly where he was and what his car looked like. And yet, the police never really bothered to take his case seriously, instead believing that this was all just a prank. And had the dispatcher simply relayed how serious the situation was, and had these officers just gotten out of their car to look more thoroughly, Kyle Plush most likely would have survived. Yeah, I feel like a lot of, a lot of these situations is gonna be like, it's gonna come down to communication, you know what I'm saying, bro? just relaying your information to the next person to make sure everybody involved gets out in the best case possible, you know, alive, you know what I'm saying? As a result of the mishandling of Kyle's case, his parents, Jill and Ron, were awarded a $6 million settlement with the city of Cincinnati. Though even more importantly for the couple, they vowed to do their part to assure that mishandled 911 calls of this nature never happen again, as they've gone on to consult with various emergency call centers to tell Kyle's story, somehow taking this horrible accident and selflessly turning it into something positive for the rest of society. Today, these phone calls remain relics of a grave error made by law enforcement, and a life that never should have been lost, with these recordings now being forever immortalized in the internet's darkest corners. This piece clearly shows the metamorphosis possible using computer graphics. We're going to play a game! Is it hide and seek? Yes, it's hide and seek! I am sick and devastated. It's April 4th, 2020. A man living in Baltimore, Maryland goes live on his Facebook page, announcing that tonight would be another one of his famous game nights. At this time, the COVID lockdown was in place all across the United States, and practically everyone was cooped up indoors, with little opportunity for real socialization. But for 24-year-old Ernest Wilson and his friends, this didn't stop them from having a good time. Ernest often hosted parties featuring childhood games like Monopoly and Uno, adding in his adult flair by turning them into drinking games, with one game in particular being top of mind that night, Hide and Seek. The evening began with Ernest inviting his Facebook friends to the function, letting them know that this time the game night would be held at an Airbnb rather than in his home, though he never gave out the address as this was a closed invitation event, which he made very clear on his page. Please don't show up with nobody I didn't personally invite if we didn't discuss it first. They're going to get left outside. Ernest took this so seriously that at one point he even called out one of his viewers, stating outright that they were not allowed to show up under any circumstances. You're not invited. You're not pulling up on me. The person who- If you're not invited, don't ask to go. What do you say? If you're not invited, don't ask to go. That's how I do Dennis Long. Just join. If you're still watching, you're not invited because you don't fucking listen. I'm gonna bang you in your mouth next time. However, it was never revealed who exactly this person was or why Ernest expressed such hostility towards them. From there, Ernest would start and stop his live stream a few different times, showing the progression of the party, which ended up with a decent turnout. <laughs> And by 2 a.m., with there being no signs of slowing down, it was time for the main event. About to play hide and seek. 
This was the caption for Ernest's final live stream of the night, which shows his group of friends preparing to play the game, turning off all the lights in the house before Ernest himself steps outside, assuming the role of the seeker, beginning his countdown as the camera keeps rolling. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I can hear y'all. Fourteen, fifteen. I can see y'all. Sixteen, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Cause I'm tired of fucking counting. Ready or not, here I come. After a long 30 seconds, it was time to find his friends, with Ernest starting his search inside the home. Ain't nobody in this bathroom. I didn't think about it. Fuck. Oh, all right. His ass. Until he notices something. Next time they want y'all ass. Down here. Out of front door lock. I'm on your ass. According to Ernest, someone was trying to get in through the front door, unaware that he had just locked it. And assuming that this was one of the people he was looking for, he took off to the backyard, believing that's where he would find them. And sure enough, he did. One, two, three. Who the f is that, G? I don't know. Get your, okay, get your dumb on the other side of this gate. Who the fuck? Ernest flips the camera around, revealing a man hopping over a gate to the backyard. He had no idea who this person was, but he seemed to assume that they were likely just trying to get into the party, not really taking it too seriously, hence his joking attitude. Though his attitude would soon shift drastically. Dumbass nigga, this can't be one of my friends. Fuck on the ground, Steve. Fuck on the ground. Fuck on the ground. <laughs> hey, Todd! Flash it up! In this moment, Ernest's live stream cuts off, and he would never go live again. According to those at the party, this unknown man hopped the fence and brandished a gun, stating that he was there to rob the place, being followed by one other person whom the group also failed to recognize. Ernest tried his best to run, but was eventually caught in the house, where after a few minutes, and for reasons unknown, the man seen hopping the fence fired his weapon, striking Ernest twice and ending his life. The killers quickly fled the scene without harming anyone else, or seemingly without even taking anything. The footage is highly disturbing, knowing that we're witnessing the final moments of a man who was just having some fun with his friends. But what makes this so much darker is that we have no idea who this person is, or why they did what they did. Even after four and a half years, Ernest Wilson's killers have yet to be identified. Detectives working on the case have theorized that this was likely a robbery gone wrong, potentially spurred on by Ernest's posting habits, as to put it bluntly, he was a drug dealer, as on his Facebook page, he often showed off huge amounts of his product, including during a live stream he did on the very day of this party. And also on the same day, Ernest had made a post about how much cash he had on him, essentially putting a target on his back. Oh, bro. One thing, bro, you got money, you know what I'm saying, bro? Especially you, you streamers, you know what I'm saying, bro? Bro, bro, just like, bro. You know, just, just don't, don't flaunt it on it, man, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because there's people out there willing to do you harm to get you a little bit of chunk of bread, you know what I'm saying? Willing to end your life. You feel me, broski? Just don't flaunt it, you know what I'm saying, bro? You can, I mean, you can, I don't know. That's, that's tough. That's tough, bro. That's a tough situation, bro. What the heck? Bro's dad is having a, bro, chilling with, with the, with the homies. Chilling with the homies. That is, that's crazy. Online, some have theorized that this botched robbery may have been committed by the person that entered Ernest's live stream earlier that night, which caused him to have that intense reaction. You're not invited. You're not pulling up on me because you don't fucking listen. I'm gonna bang you in your mouth next time. Though to my knowledge, this person has never actually been tracked down. But by far the most common sentiment online was that Ernest's friends were involved to some capacity, as none of them were injured and none of their possessions were taken, making it clear that at the very least, this crime was targeted at the host. 
And on top of this, remember, Ernest never shared the address for that Airbnb, yeah, at least right. not publicly. And yet, these people just so happened to show up to the home at the exact moment that Ernest was by himself in the dark. And perhaps most chillingly, as the robbery is unfolding, you can hear one of Ernest's friends chuckling in the background. This can't be one of my friends. <laughs> Though as concerning as this is, it's sadly far from conclusive. And to this day, it appears that Ernest's case is slowly being lost to time, leaving us for now with only questions. And one of the more disturbing live streams I've ever seen. And now, these messages. Before we dive into our next case, I want to first thank today's video. Obviously, be careful on the internet, but like, like for real though. You know what I'm saying? Look like it's about to be a sponsorship, I ain't gonna lie. How you doing? You know, get your money up, get your money up, ain't gonna lie. Is this, is this, um, Hello Eats? Or was it Fr Hello Fresh? I don't know. It's one of, one of those, Hello Eats or Hello Fresh. I, one, of, one of them ones, I don't know. As evidenced by the previous case and several others discussed throughout the series, live streams are often a hotbed for disturbing moments online. And when researching Ernest's final stream, I came across yet another example of just how dark things can get when the cameras go live. It happened on January 22nd, 2017, when a 14-year-old girl named Naika Venent went on Facebook Live with a caption, in the stream, Naika discussed how difficult life had been. Throughout the years, she had been placed in and out of countless foster homes, where her treatment ranged from poor to straight-up abusive, with this constant mistreatment leading her to just want it to be over already. And based on the title of the stream, it was clear what her intentions were going to be. As the live stream progressed, hundreds of people flooded into the video to see what exactly was going on, as word quickly spread that something horrible was about to happen, though you wouldn't know it by looking at the chat. According to many watching, those in the comments had no sympathy for the girl, as many actually mocked her, calling her names, and even commented laughing emojis as she desperately tried to open up, with those same commenters viewing this not as a cry for help, but as a cry for attention, outright pushing her to carry on with these intentions. And tragically, she did, all while the camera remained rolling. However, even after she followed through with this, the behavior of her chats didn't stop. Whether they assumed it was fake or just didn't care either way, the hateful barrage of insults actually got even more vile once she had obviously passed away. And this went past just words, as people who knew her actually began making parody videos of the girl, replicating the position she was dead in, all while her livestream continued running. It would take over an hour before police would finally be called and retrieve her body, with the stream being shut down by Facebook shortly before. It was an awful situation all around. But what I found most saddening about this was her final reason for doing what she did, as she stated simply that she just wanted to be with her real mother, who she loved so dearly. And this was something that seemed to be the plan all along, as her mother, Gina Alexis, claimed that she too desperately wanted to be reunited with her daughter. And following her daughter's highly publicized death, Gina actually came forward at a news conference to discuss the tragedy. Her biological mother broke down while speaking about her daughter's death she dreamed of one day being reunited permanently. I have just in Florida fought to get people to care for my baby. Where she blamed the entire foster care system for everything that had happened, believing that they didn't do a good enough job of keeping her daughter safe, and they failed to try and reunite her with Naika. Because of the obvious emotion involved and the overall shocking nature of this case, the news report would quickly go viral, leading to widespread support for the grieving mother. However, this also caused some people to look a bit deeper into what exactly led up to this live stream, for which one piece of information was brought to light that somehow made this case even more upsetting. On the day that Naika's life came to an end, it was revealed that her mother was actually in the stream watching before and after it happened, seeing her own daughter having this mental breakdown, as well as seeing all those people in the chat mocking her, which made people feel even more sorry for Gina as her plight was unimaginable though this wasn't the only revelation to come forward, as it was soon realized by the investigators looking into Naika's case that Gina had not only witnessed all of these people laughing at her daughter and egging her into ending her life, but she had also joined them as well. 
Hashtag ADHD games played. You sad little DCF custody. That's why you are where you're at. For this dumb shit and more, you keep crying wolf. You dead, you will get buried, life goes on after it that doesn't listen to their parents, trying to be grown, seeking boys and girls' attention instead of her books. In a live stream where one of the last things Naika ever said was that she desperately wanted to be reunited with her mother, that same mother was not only watching, but actively pushing her to follow through on her plans, leaving this comment where she outright says that it doesn't matter if you live or die, life goes on. And it got even worse. The media also discovered that the reason Naika had been removed from her custody to begin with was because Gina had beaten her 30 plus times with a belt when she was only six years old. On top of this, Gina often texted Naika saying that she wanted nothing to do with her, despite the young girl frequently reaching out and begging to be part of her life. Eventually, Gina would tell Naika's caseworker that, the girl is y'all's problem, I'm done with the games before sending Naika middle finger emojis when all she did was ask to see her brother. And this is all amongst other things that are far more horrendous that I really don't want to get into. And yet, after Naika's death, Gina had the audacity to go on television in an attempt to garner sympathy for a death that she clearly contributed to, saying that all she wanted was to be the girl's mother, despite rejecting her at every turn. And honestly, this is where I thought this entire story would come to an end, until I noticed something strange when I was editing this video. Naika's Facebook page is still active. It's no longer posting anything original, but instead, the account is consistently reposting content from another page, a page run by Gina. After Naika's death, Gina seemingly seized control of the young girl's Facebook account, where she now posts her own content, which includes her attempting to defend the fact that she gave up on Naika. Tell me what mother would accept a 13 going on 14 year old in and out of detention centers going to jail or getting arrested while in foster care hmm? as well as her responding to those who blamed her for her daughter's death people be like you heard the rumors going around about you and i did <laughs> but i forgot to tell you one thing that i don't give a fuck <laughs> huh what's my name my first name is very much my last and even some posts where she's promoting her podcast, as it seems that after all this, Gina's actually trying to carve out some sort of career as an influencer, as she posts videos gar- I'm literally shocked and disgusted, honestly, bro. Like, I like my- I don't know if you can tell my facial expressions, expressions. I'm actually disgusted. I'm actually disgusted, bro. What? You're trying to- So at the end of the day, you're trying to make money from your, from your kid's death? Even though you drove him to, oh, that's that's messed up. I ain't gonna lie, bro. My stomach hurts. My stomach. Garnering sympathy for the loss of her daughter, along with giving out parenting advice. Like, there's so much stuff that parents need to do for their child that they're not motherfucking doing. They're not paying attention because they're taking the easy way out. With all this making it even more obvious that Gina has little to no remorse for what she did. On the 11th of June, 2009, a young man named Eugene Lata took to an urban exploration forum and wrote in broken English, Hello, I'd like to tell you about Odessa catacombs. Odessa is not far from the capital of Ukraine, oh, Kiev. Under Odessa the consists the biggest- me, bro. See, see, that's what I call life through activities, bro. Like, you can't catch me in no, in no cave. You're not gonna catch me in no, in no cap, nothing like that, bro. See, no, 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 no. That is all you, bro. What? catacombs in the world. Their total length is more than 2,500 kilometers, so these catacombs are much bigger than the Paris catacombs. During World War II, a lot of citizens were hiding in the catacombs. A lot of them used to live there for a year and more, so even today it is possible to find weapons, equipment, and even dead bodies. Every year a lot of explorers get lost and even die there. His post was accompanied by a series you could have a million dollars to go to the catacombs. No, thank you. You know I me? Mean? Two million. No, thank you. Five hundred million. No, thank you. <laughs> These are photographs from the underground labyrinth, which stretched over 1,500 miles, its paths winding aimlessly deep below the surface of the earth. The structure was mainly the result of limestone mining many years ago, though despite this, it was never properly mapped and was, conversely, not often explored, essentially being a pitch-black maze to nowhere. 
given that the area wasn't well known back in 09, the post was met with amazement. Fellow urban explorers applauded the location and the photographs that Lata had taken, wanting to see even more. And since he was a native of the area, Lata delivered. Her name was Masha, and she was only 19 years old. Three long months later in April of 2005, Lata and his group would stumble across the body, immediately reporting their findings to the police. The law enforcement refused to even try and venture down there in order to retrieve her, as they knew just how dangerous and unmapped this environment was. It would take two long years for her body to be recovered. Thanks to a friend of Lata writing a strongly worded letter to the government that included a photo of Masha's body. The story is unimaginable. To be trapped in a place like this with no means of escaping, it has to be the absolute worst way to go. And because of the gruesome nature of the story and the photograph, it spread all throughout the online world, where it became a legendary internet mystery. As even with the added context, many were still left with pressing questions. Were Masha's friends involved in some way with her death? Had they abandoned her there on purpose? And did Lata know more than he claimed? But as it turns out, there was one far more pressing question that needed to be answered. In 2015, a full decade after this photo was taken, a journalist named Mike Pearl had picked up the case with the hopes of writing a Halloween article for Vice. And in his research, he made a rather unusual discovery, as according to him, Masha seemingly didn't exist. Pearl was never able to find any verifiable proof that a girl named Masha had ever gone missing in that area. He was also not able to find any death records of anyone by that name either, or even any reports of a body being pulled from the catacombs during this time frame. Something just wasn't adding up, and it got stranger from here. Sometime after the photograph began making its rounds, one of the most prominent explorers of the Odessa catacombs put out a statement on his own website in regards to Masha, which read, Besides the original photographer, there isn't one person, civilian or law enforcement, that can confirm the story. We believe it is just a practical joke and the corpse is fake. Following this revelation, Pearl was able to track down Lata, who was unable to recount where the body was roughly seen, or even how to get in touch with the other people shown in this photo, none of whom had ever come forward to back his testimony, which makes the credibility of Lata and his story of Masha incredibly shaky at best. However, this is where the crux of the mystery stands today. When looking at these photos, one thing is apparent to me and essentially everyone else who has seen them. The corpse shown seems very real. and matches the decay of the bodies found in similar environments, with that one prominent Odessa explorer eventually deleting his statement at some point over the years, leaving the general consensus that this is in fact a real corpse. But if the story of Masha isn't true, then who is this? Well, we have no idea. It's entirely a mystery. But the reality of the situation is that bodies being found down in these catacombs isn't totally uncommon. Over the years, many explorers have gotten lost down there and suffered the exact same fate as the story of Masha. But on top of this, these tunnels have also been used by murderers as a dumping ground for their victims' bodies, with either one of these scenarios being possible in this case. Though the frustrating part is that we may never actually know who this person was or how they died as I and many others have doubts that this body was ever actually recovered, just simply due to lack of public information and news reports about it. And instead, the reality is that this corpse is probably still down there somewhere, and has simply been lost to time, as sections of the catacombs have been known to flood and cave in, sealing them off from the outside world forever. So for now, and potentially the rest of time, the story of Masha will remain an internet mystery. Yo, I got chills a little bit. Ain't gonna lie, that last one kind of put me in. Ain't gonna lie, it wasn't. It was. It wasn't, it wasn't that spooky, but it's just like a little. I got goosebumps. Like, I actually got goosebumps though. Like, let me see if I can show you my 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 leggy. Can you see the goosebumps? You can't see the goosebumps. You just see my knee. Plot twist. I was actually just trying to show you my knee. <laughs> jokes, 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 jokes. Okay, okay. A forest. Uh. <laughs> So I'm not scared of forces at night. I'm, nah, bro. I'm, man, come on now. It's September 1985. Nine. A hunter oh. trudges through the wooded terrain of Chris. Give me, me breathe. <laughs> me breathe, Jack, bro. What the fuck? What the fuck? Creek, Montana, on the trail of something Montana. big. 
He had been hunting a large black bear and managed to land a single shot, causing the animal to take off, leaving behind a trail of blood. He followed this trail all throughout the remote region before stumbling across a shallow ditch where he would find a body. Though not the body of the bear he had just shot, and rather, the body of a woman reduced to bone. The remains were quickly sent off for forensic analysis, though very little could be determined other than the fact that she was a young woman and that she had been murdered, as they found two bullet holes in her skull. With there being essentially no other information to go off of, a special team at the FBI started creating a composite of what this woman may have looked like. This was the result. How long you gotta be dead for your, for like, and it's just your bones left, you know what I'm saying? Like how... This was their first attempt at depicting Miss Jane Doe, who they would later dub Christy Crystal Creek, though it wouldn't be their last. The uncanniness of these depictions is undeniable, and recently, I've fallen down this rabbit hole of disturbing police sketches and recreations. As though these can often be very helpful and do lead to legitimately good results, there are often times where they appear almost non-human with many examples like Christie's being shared online on the FBI's website in order to enlist the public's help in identifying these victims, with one of the more notorious examples coming decades later. Yo, you think with AI, they gonna, like, identifying, like, missing persons and stuff, like, people like that gonna get easier, bro? Or you think it's gonna be, like, like a little bit more difficult? Because, I, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like AI can make a pretty realistic person. I don't know. I don't 2014. The discovery was made on June 5th of that year, when a group of highway workers were mowing grass in the town of Geneva, Wisconsin, when they noticed a pair of strange-smelling suitcases. Inside them were two bodies belonging to two women, both in various stages of decomposition, and both appearing to have been strangled to death. One would quickly be identified as 37-year-old Laura Simonson, while the other was in much worse shape and distinguishing her facial features proved extremely difficult. But this didn't stop them from trying. This is one of the more infamous examples out there due to just how unnatural it appears, with the face of this woman being turned into a meme and even being used in a video game. But to me, there's one example that I've never been able to shake, as the entire story and its recreation gives me such an uneasy feeling. The discovery was made all the way back in April of 1977, when a couple in Alberta, Canada had returned to their often abandoned cabin in order to empty the septic tank, only to find a body floating inside. The body was in brutal shape and showed signs of extreme torture, as the man had been beaten, mutilated, burned with cigarettes, and even shot multiple times. And due to the condition of the body, it was impossible to identify him. Though regardless, a recreation was made, and using a computer model of the man's skull, they slowly pieced him together. He would later be dubbed Septic Tank Sam. There's something so depressing about these composites, as these are real people with real stories and real names that have been reduced to these horrifying images and tacky nicknames. But there's another side of these police sketches too, as when dealing with victims, it's obviously incredibly sad. But when dealing with suspects, these off-putting identities can be outright horrifying. Over the years, there's been numerous unidentified killers who law enforcement were not able to positively identify, forcing them to turn to these same methods of sketching and recreating with one of the darkest examples being that of the Lake Bodum killer. It was June 5th, 1960. Four Finnish teenagers were on a camping trip to Lake Bodum, sleeping peacefully in their tent on the lakeshore, when suddenly they were attacked. It happened in an instant, as a man yielding a knife began stabbing through the tent, eventually bludgeoning the group with an unidentified blunt object. That night, three of the teens would be killed, while one managed to survive with substantial injuries. When asked about what he had seen that night, the lone survivor claimed that the man who attacked them wore all black and had large red eyes. Based on his accounts and other potential sightings, a sketch of what this man may have looked like was made, and the results were unusual at best. With this man going on to garner the appropriate nickname of Bug Eyes McLip, due to just how unnatural his facial features appear, 
especially his eyes. In fact, there's something unnatural about all of these recreations, which begs the question, did any of them actually work? Well, surprisingly, out of these four people, three have been identified. Christy Crystal Creek would go on to be identified as Janet Lee Lucas, a 23-year-old who would be the last identified victim of serial killer Wayne Nance, with this identification being the result of improved forensic genealogy. The second and most notorious example would go on to be identified as Jenny Gomez, who had been strangled by Steven Zillich, a man dubbed the Wisconsin Suitcase Murderer. And despite this recreation appearing to look nothing like Jenny, it was actually the sole reason that she was identified, as one of her family members ended up recognizing these overpronounced cheekbones and matching them to Jenny. And then there was Septic Tank Sam, who was revealed to be Gordon Edwin Sanderson, thanks again to genetic genealogy, as a sample of his sister's DNA was eventually used to prove that this was in fact him, though it's still unknown who killed him or why which leaves just this final person, the killer of at least three people. He, unfortunately, has never been identified, and this isn't too surprising as the features of this person just seem impossible. He just looks far too strange to be real, yeah, right? Well, even though he hasn't been positively ID'd, it doesn't mean that he hasn't been potentially photographed. Shortly after the teens were murdered, a funeral was held in their remembrance, for which a large crowd of locals were in attendance, with this photo of the crowd being snapped. And standing there, in the center of it all, was a man whose features looked impossible. This man would never be photographed again, and his connection to the case has never been officially confirmed, leaving these murders unsolved to this very day.